Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And we are talking about Sherman DD tanks on Omaha Beach today. Uh, the big thing being, were they as much a as a disaster as so many commonplace documentaries say? I'll just say this right at the beginning, two, th two caveats. One is I'd love to cover the Commonwealth beaches at some point in the future, either break them down separately and do Sword, Gold and Juno as separate beaches or lump them together. I saw the chat in the sidebar. Stephen Fisher's out there. Brad Sanquaz watching. Happy to do that at some point. But today we're focusing on Omaha Beach. My other second point I want to make before we go into the show and bring in Steve is I found out literally half an hour ago that Carlton Joyce passed away. Now, you may or may not know the name Carlton Joyce. I just put up this graphic I made a minute ago. He died at 92 years old. He wrote in a seminal book back in the day called Stand Where They Fought. Uh, if you're the kind of person that gets General Dwight Eisenhower to do the blurb for your book and Martin Blumenson, you were doing some good work back in the day. And he is one of those guys that was a bit of a a legend amongst normally tour guys. He passed away this morning, so I wanted to pay brief respects to him. So that was to um to hit Carlton Joyce. But right now I'm going to bring in my guest, Steve Zaloga. You've seen him before. We talked about Point of Heart. We've talked about the Battle of the Bulge. We're going back to one of his favorite subjects, his Omaha Beach. I'll just hold up a couple of books to prove that I'm a complete fanboy. There's these couple of books there, Tanks of D-Day, Arab Tanks in Normandy, both by Osprey. And of course, a really cracking book on Omaha Beach called The Devil's Garden. I've got others, but I can only fit so many in my office when I'm going to go live. But I'll bring in Steve now. Good afternoon, Steve. How are you today? Good afternoon. Doing fine. So there we are. Omaha Beach DD tanks. How many times have you and I and everybody watching this sat and watched the documentary where they've said at some point and part of the disaster at Omaha Beach was because all the tanks sunk and and, and we must just roll our eyes and throw things at the screen. And, and because of that, this is something you've really wanted to get the work done under. You've, you've looked into this story and, and, and DD tanks. Um, it's a fascinating subject, isn't it? So, you know, obviously, as I said there, you want to kind of correct some of the myths. But but is that the main reason for writing about it? Because people think that they know it and they know it wrong? Uh, certainly. And you see it everywhere. I mean, if you look at a movie like Saving Private Ryan, What's the classic line, um, you know, from the Tom Hanks character? Oh, the tanks didn't get ashore. And needless to say, the uh, veterans from 743rd Tank Battalion were fairly upset about that little statement. And um, But you see it everywhere. You see it in quite a few of the written histories of the war. And it just seems to be in the popular memory. Um, it's just mm -hmm. gotten cemented into the popular memory, whether it has any basis in fact or not. No, absolutely. And it's it's that thing about with the, the general forgetting that, that landings are not just the first wave. There's wave upon wave of both infantry, engineers and tanks coming ashore. And so much of the focus is always on the first bits that where it went perhaps less well and less on the second and third and fourth and fifth waves where things went better. So they're progressive waves of armor. But anyway, you've come armed with a PowerPoint that you'll just tell me when to move on the slides. And folks, We'll kind of do a few questions as we go along, but I think if you've seen Steve before, you'll know that it's going to be pretty comprehensive, this this show. So we'll probably leave the big questions to the end, but feel free to make your comments. But basically, I'm going to hand over to Steve uh, to talk about this. And the clue, the, the big point there is the question mark after D-Day there in that first slide there. That's the thing where, was it the disaster? But basically, over to you to, uh, to take us through this subject, Steve. Okay, if we can go to the first slide. Uh, the origins of the myth. I think that where this comes up from is um, right at the end of the war, uh, the 79th Armored Division did two internal histories. They did a, a semi-public one and they did a, a basically a secret report. And here's two quotes from uh, both of those. Um, at one point, the upper one says, and of these later, speaking about the DD tanks, 90% foundered in the very rough sea on the swim and um, and then the later uh, one from the secret report says, here DD tanks were unable to reach the shores. And so um, a lot of historians picked up from this without really questioning the statement, you know, why did they think that 79th Armored Division knew anything about the U.S. beaches? But so Chester Wilmot sort of repeats it, and then Max Hastings sort of repeats it in a slightly different way in his history from 1984. And it's repeated in quite a few histories. Um, I don't mean to blame those people in particular. But in any event, many of the early histories uh, uh, stated either that few, if any, of the DD tanks landed on Omaha Beach. Uh, so let's jump to the next slide. Um, the DD tanks were not the first effort by the U.S. Army to uh, develop amphibious tanks. Obviously, the U.S. Army was very concerned about amphibious landings also in the Pacific. So there were some efforts in the United States to develop amphibious tanks 
tanks before um, the eventual DD tanks. One of the earliest and one directly connected with the DD tanks was the uh, M3E4 based on the M3 Stewart light tank. And that was the early version of the DD tank using the Strassler device, the uh, the screen around the tank for um, uh, to keep the tank buoyant. But instead of being powered by its tracks and by a propeller, um, it instead was powered by outboard motors. So in any event, the U.S. Army, uh, uh, British Army convinced the U.S. Army to test out this concept. Uh, one was built in uh, September 1942. It was tested. The U.S. Army determined that it could be easily sunk by machine gun fire, so the concept was dropped. Um, there was another light tank program at the time called T-10. really didn't get beyond paper studies, but um, it was using pontoons for buoyancy rather than for using uh, screens. Uh, next slide. At the same time, it's important to realize what was happening on the naval side of things. There were an enormous number of innovations taking place with landing craft, especially with the Royal Navy and to a lesser extent with the U.S. Navy. Certainly the most important for our story is the LCT, the landing craft tank, um, which comes onto the scene in 1942 in significant numbers. Um, that plays a direct role in Omaha Beach, uh, the story there. Uh, it's worth mentioning other types of craft being developed at this time, uh, the LCM, landing craft mechanized. That plays a much more important role out in the Pacific because on the Pacific, the U.S. Navy has LSDs, landing ship docks, and so the LCMs could be launched from the LSDs. Uh, that doesn't play a role um, at Normandy during Operation Neptune. There simply aren't, aren't enough LSDs. Uh, next slide. Besides DD tanks, the, um, the other technology that's important both for D-Day and for many other amphibious operations is uh, deep wading tanks. Um, in the U.S. Army, this was a secret pro program called Project Blue Freeze. Um, that basically involves waterproofing the tank, meaning waterproofing all the electrical systems, um, and uh, putting on a type of snorkel device, a, a deep wading trunk, which allowed air to get into the engine compartment um, so that the tank could wade roughly up to the height of its turret. Um, uh, Project Blue Freeze took place in 1942. Uh, these deep wading trunks were developed for a wide variety of both tanks and other types of vehicles, including trucks and Jeeps. Um, it was first used by the U.S. Army uh, during Operation Torch in November 1942. The picture over on the left there, on the very, very far left, you can see an M5 uh, light tank fitted with the uh, Blue Freeze device. Uh, pictures of that particular operation um, are very rare. It was considered very, very secret at the time. So there's very, very few pictures that come out of uh, Operation Torch of the use of uh, Blue Freeze. Um, at the time of uh, Operation Husky on Sicily in July 1943, uh, it was very widely uh, used. A lot more photos appear. So you see a picture of, of an M4A1 coming ashore. I might also add that this was really a joint uh, British-U.S. program. It wasn't specifically U.S., the blue freeze uh, part of it is U.S., especially the um, waterproofing of the of the electrical systems. Um, it's one of the reasons the Sherman tank and American tanks ended up being so reliable. They made a decision in the middle of 1942 to waterproof all production tanks, not simply the ones for amphibious operations. And that has beneficial results for overall tank reliability later in the war. Um, let's jump to the next one. Uh, uh, okay, so we have deep wading tanks. They're used in November 42. Uh, they were first used, uh, ignoring the U.S. Army for a moment, they were first used at Dieppe in August 1942 on the Canadian Churchills. Um, so the issue is, if deep wading works, why bother with DD tanks? And the reason is somewhat clear in this picture. It's not so much the issue of the tanks, it's the issue of the LCTs. Um, and what happened at Dieppe is of the 10 LCTs that took part in the landing, uh, all 10 of them were either sunk or severely damaged during the operation. So there was a very, very serious concern about um, the use of deep wading tanks in the sense that with a deep wading tank, the LCT has to come ashore to drop off the tank. The idea behind the DD tank is, is there a method to release the tank further out to shore, uh, from shore several thousand yards so that the LCT would not have to come in close to shore and drop off the tanks? So that's the motivation behind DD as compared to deep wading. And I just, I'm glad you mentioned that because Stephen Fisher, see Spitfires is watching and you know, he's always on Twitter trying to remind us that 
it's a it's a combined arms approach and it's not just about tanks it's how tanks fit into the craft that support them how the engineers work alongside that how the fleet works alongside that and preservation of lcts preservation of, of landing craft is is key because of the uh, we, we, go, we said it earlier on the number of waves that have to come ashore uh th there's always a shortage whatever type we're talking about so i'm glad you you reinforced the idea that the use of the tanks isn't just based on their suitability suitability on the beach it's about the actual getting of them to the the, the, the beach and the, the preserving of the craft so thanks for that oh yeah well I, this is a classic combined arms operation i mean yeah. you have to talk about the the other arms and especially with the naval aspects when dealing with amphibious operations um okay dd tanks one point that I'd like to accent, this is perhaps more the American viewpoint. DD tanks are a technical solution to a tactical problem. Um, and the reason is the U.S. Army has this attitude, and it's actually shared by uh, the British Army. The real problem at Dieppe wasn't simply, you know, the method of landing the tanks, the vulnerability of the LCTs. It was that the operation was conducted against an extremely heavily defended port. Um, there were major German coastal batteries on either side of Dieppe, and Dieppe itself was very heavily defended. And so from a, a different perspective, DD tanks are a technical solution to what is eventually and ultimately a tactical problem, the, the vulnerability to the coastal guns. And the tactical solution versus the tactical solution is don't land at a heavily defended port um, that's protected by coastal guns. And that is the lesson that comes out of Dieppe um, that leads to Operation Neptune. Uh, the uh, Operation Neptune is not conducted against Le Havre or one of the major ports for the very uh, simple reason that Allied planners understood that that would be very, very difficult because of the defenses on those ports. The Atlantic Wall was designed specifically or was heavily oriented towards the defend defense of ports. So the key lesson taken out of Dieppe is you can't land at heavily defended ports. And so you have to land with methods to allow you to land at beaches that are less he heavily defended. So if we can jump to the next uh, slide. Um, there were uh, attempts prior to the adoption of DD tanks by the U.S. Army. Um, uh, there was a, a British liaison team in Washington that was talking to their U.S. counterparts earlier in 1943 about amphibious tanks, and specifically the early versions of the DD tank, not the one based on the Sherman, but the earlier type, the first type that was based on, on the Valentine. And so there was a... Um, discussion in April of 1943 with uh, the British uh, uh, teams in in Washington trying to convince the U.S. Uh, Ordnance Department to uh, start building Valentine DDs in the United States. Um, they went to both the United States Marine Corps for possible use in the Pacific and to the U.S. Army. The Marine Corps reaction was, um, no, we don't like DD tanks. They're too vulnerable, too fragile in Pacific conditions. And then on top of it, the Marine Corps itself was working on its own amphibious tanks at the time namely the LVTA-1 uh, AM tanks that were based on the, uh, the earlier uh, Amtraks. And those first get into service in early 1944 at Kwajalein. So um, the Marine Corps rejects the idea or fails to provide any support. The U.S. Army has a variety of opinions on the matter. Um, number one, the U.S. Army is convinced that deep wading tanks are the solution. They were used in November 42 at Torch and once again in Sicily. They would again be used um, in other uh, operations, for example, ANZIO. Um, early U.S. experience with the Straussler device convinced the U.S. Army that the uh, the canvas weighting uh, concept is basically flawed. Um, the U.S. Army didn't like the Valentine. It was too weakly armed by 1944 standards. And the U.S. Army felt that the LCTs are okay if we don't land at heavily defended ports. You know, getting back to this mm. uh, tactical issue rather than the technical issue. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, regardless of the opinion of the U.S. Army, the U.S. Marine Corps, the staffs in Washington, um, things start to develop on the on in the European uh, arena, especially over in London. And basically what happens is that Cossack, the early planners, the initial planners for Neptune, um, basically decide to use DDs um, in the first waves as a method to get some armor support of, um, uh, available in the first waves. And, you know, so that drops one of the U.S. objections. Uh, the Sherman tank is obviously more suitable than the Valentine as far as firepower is concerned. And so um, in October uh, 1943, the G3 from uh, uh, U.S. Army East, uh, European Theater of Operations 
request the production of 199 Sherman DD tanks in the United States to support U.S. operations uh, during Neptune Overlord. This is enough DD tanks for three tank battalions. Um, what ends up happening, this doesn't immediately happen. At the beginning of 1943, Major General Ray Barker, the highest ranking American on the Cossack staff, um, goes to the ETO USA headquarters and requests DDs on an urgent basis. It's already November 1943. Uh, they expect that the invasion is going to happen in May 44. So things have got to get rolling. So Barker goes to the head of the ETO USA at the time, uh, Lieutenant General Jacob Beavers, who uh, headed ETO before Eisenhower was appointed later in the year. And um, Deavers says, and Deavers incidentally was the former commander of Armored Command in the United States. He was mm. very instrumental in the uh, in the uh, the development of the armored force in the United States. So he's very well aware of armor issues. And Devers tells Barker, "Well, we've never seen a DD tank. Nobody's ever told us anything about this. You know, this is kind of a surprise to us. You know, start to fill us in." So um, a demonstration is held uh, using Valentine DDs, and um, it's explained to Devers why the Cossack planners want DD tanks. And Devers really isn't aware of all those debates that are going on in Washington in the summer. But in any event, Devers goes and sends a courier directly to the United States to urge both the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, namely George C. Marshall, and the head of AGF to approve an urgent plan for DDs because it's getting late, you know, middle of November 1943. So the Army Chief of Staff, General uh, George Marshall, agrees and grants the DD project a AAA priority, which is very unusual in the United States for tank programs. It's it's typical for things like, you know, the Manhattan Project or the B-29 or some projects like that, but it's not the sort of things you usually give into a tank program. But in any event, Marshall understands the urgency and he grants the program AAA priority. Um, the problem is, is that the DD, the Sherman version of the DD is not really complete. Um, Straussler is continuing to refine the design and the last DD, uh, the last set of DD plans, which were flown over directly from the UK, they arrive in the U.S. Um, in January 1944. Now, earlier plans had arrived. They started to arrive in December 1943. A program was set up um, in the Ohio Military District to do the conversions. And so when the final set arrives, the tanks are, at least the initial batch, is pretty much ready to go. So the first uh, U.S.-built uh, Sherman DD tank um, is, completes, is completed on the 23rd of January 1944. I'm going to show you how the level of urgency First one was completed 23 January 1944. The first 10 U.S. supply DD tanks arrived in the U.K. on 10 March 1944. And the first batch, the first 199, arrived by April. Um, what happens in the meantime is, is that uh, Britain is actually slower for a variety of reasons in producing their own DD Shermans. And there's a discussion between Devers and Montgomery um, over British requirements. Basically, Montgomery tells Devers, um, we need some assistance getting DD tanks because if we can't get some more Sherman DDs, we're going to have to use Valentines. And so Devers agrees and sends a request back to Washington that they increase the number from 199 U.S. DDs to 350 with the aim to give the access to the British Commonwealth uh, uh, tank regiments. Um, so of the 290 DD tanks that were available for use on DD, on D-Day, um, 172 are U.S. conversions and 118 are U.K. conversions. And that's okay. a point that's oftentimes forgotten. Everybody thinks the DD tanks are purely British. Well, the design certainly is British, but the actual physical conversion work, um, the majority were done in the U.S. Okay, quick question for you from Trent Talenko. Did the Cossack planners consider the U.S. Army Ordnance T-6 Ritchie device for the DD tank role? Was there anything in the Cossack records about it? No, um, because the Ritchie device wasn't ready yet. Um, I'll mention at the end of the book, I, or at the end of this, the, the talk, I did a book on U.S. amphibious tanks. It includes a history of the Ritchie device, and we could go into more detail about that, but that comes later. It's not it's not used in the Pacific until 1945. Um, okay. I'm, I'm just putting up a quick picture of a DD tank for the audience. You know, anybody who's not familiar with what a DD tank is, you know, you start off basically with a Sherman tank, and... Um, the Strassler device, the canvas screen is erected around it to make it buoyant. Um, besides the exterior canvas, there's inflatable columns that basically act as the main support to get the, um, the screen up. And then there's metal reinforcing struts to hold the uh, screen up once it's in the water. Um, the 
as in comparison to the early Strassler devices, the um, the DD tank uses a feature called duplex drive. That's where the name uh, uh, DD comes from. And what that means is that there's a drive between the rear drive sprocket and a propeller at the rear of the tank. And that's what propels it. Um, on the early Strassler devices, they used outboard motors, which was not really very successful. But the, the DD part, the duplex drive, actually is a very successful um, addition to the whole concept. Uh, next slide. Uh, quick note on USDD conversions. Um, the US conversions were based on M4A1s, uh, whereas the British conversions were done on M4A4s. Two different engines, two different hull designs. Strangely enough, the reason the U.S. Army picked the M4A1 is that somebody in Detroit thought that the M4A1 hull was more streamlined. You know, because if you're aware of the M4A1, it's the one that uses the cast hull. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that has nothing to do with swimming in the water. Um, just kind of a weird anecdote about why they picked the M4A1. Um, so in any event, they start coming over to the U.K. in, uh, in March. They immediately start being used for training the three U.S. battalions that are going to be involved in Neptune. Uh, the first problem that they have is they start having crew asphyxiation problems. And the issue is, is that when the um, DD goes into the water, the screen holds the exhaust fumes within inside the, scr the, uh, the screen. The exhaust is coming up through the rear um, exhaust port. And so um, the, the first solution is to put a canvas screen the picture at the lower left shows the canvas screen. If you look immediately behind the turret, you'll see that they added a canvas screen there to uh, try to trap the exhaust gas. Um, that didn't work very well. Before D-Day, the three U.S. battalions receive a metal chimney. You can see it in the picture on the lower right. And that would push away the um, exhaust fumes up into the air above the screens. The other problem that became evident during the, um, the training was that the screens were too fragile. Um, the US Army was working on an alternative called the Yegao device. Um, you can see pictures in the upper uh, right. And that was basically just putting um, more rigid metal um, struts inside rather than relying on those inflatable towers. And the Yegao device did make it a lot more durable in the water, but the problem with it was is that the device was not um, ready in time for D-Day. And so it never proceeded beyond um, uh, test examples. Uh, next slide. And just a quick question for you. It, once the, the, the use of training uh, of DD tanks is, is, is begun in, in the UK, is the training between US DD operators and British and Canadian completely separate? Or is there any overlap? Because my understanding has always been it was always completely separate. Um, there's two types of training. There is uh, training that was done on a lake. And I forget off the top of my head the name of the lake in the UK where it took place, which was used both by Commonwealth or by British, Canadian and U.S. forces. In fact, there's a book out on it. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what it was called, but that particular training facility was multinational. Um, the training that was done, um, the, the training that was done in the, in the ocean versus the lake training, those were generally separate. Um, the U.S. training was mostly slapped in sands. Um, and uh, that was also uh, uh, where the U.S. Army did um, deep wading training, which is the picture here shows uh, some of the training at Slapton Sand in early 1944. Um, but switching from that to um, the higher level discussions, uh, the first meeting of U.S. senior commanders appointed for Neptune uh, uh, takes place on the 21st of December 1943. That's Omar Bradley from 1st U.S. Army and the Corps Commander um, responsible for Omaha Beach, uh, Leonard Giroux. Um, they start discussing the whole issue of how they're going to land the tanks. Um, Giroux is opposed to the use of DD tanks. He had seen demonstrations. He doesn't like them. And so he argues uh, with Bradley. Brad Bradley really doesn't care one way or the other. I shouldn't say he doesn't care. Bradley doesn't know anything about this. Bradley's an infantry guy. And so he's aware of the fact that they're building these DD tanks. He's aware of the deep wading tanks, this sort of issue, you know, because of his connection with the operations on Sicily and in North Africa. But in any event, Giroux is somewhat um, uh, insistent on it. And Giroux basically says, well, if, um, you know, rather than having DD, uh, DD tanks, and if the LCTs are too vulnerable, let's take LCMs and land M7 light tanks with 57 millimeter guns. There's two problems here. Number one, Joe was not informed, but the M7 light tank program had been canceled by uh, December 1943. So they're not going to get those. 
And number two, the Navy, the Royal Navy in particular, but the U.S. Navy as well, they oppose the use of LCMs. There's a variety of reasons here. Number one, the LCM, uh, unless it has a light tank in it, is not really that seaworthy going across the channel. But beyond that, the Royal Navy doesn't want, you know, hundreds of little LCMs bobbing around in the channel, um, you know, during the process of Operation Neptune. Um, there are some LCMs used, obviously, during um, Neptune, but they want to limit the number of them. So in any event, Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy also oppose the use of LCMs due to congestion. So the, um, the compromise is within the U.S. tank battalions um, slated for Neptune, each of the battalions will land uh, two companies of DD tanks and one company of deep wading tanks. Um, now, just the final line there, we were talking about training a little while ago. Um, the U.S. Army, the three battalions involved on the U.S. side, um, from during the spring, early summer of 1944, they conduct 1,200 DD tank training launches. Uh, uh, during this process, uh, three tanks are sunk. Uh, I think all three of these were in the ocean, and three crewmen were lost. So there, there was some awareness of, um, you know, the fragility of DD tanks. That, you know, this wasn't a, a major surprise, but the, the number of losses prior to D-Day were, were, were actually pretty small. Um, here's just some pictures of the training. This is from Slapton Sands. Um, the pictures over on the upper left are um, deep wading tanks. You can see the trunks on them. The uh, shot in the upper right is a DD tank. This is an unloaded tank. It doesn't have it doesn't have its full ammo load. You can see how high it's riding. Um, you put the full ammo load in, and it, it'll ride down lower. Um, the shot in the middle is a, a fairly rare shot. One of the few shots uh, taken in color of DDs um, prior to uh, the D-Day landings. Um, DD tanks at this point were considered absolutely top secret, so there was very little um, still photography done of DD tanks prior to D-Day. Uh, next slide. Uh, landing. Um, there were different methods to land the different companies. Um, in the case of the companies that were landing with the deep wading tanks, they used LCA-5s. That's a version of the LCT-5, but it had armor on it, um, armor on the bow and armor around some of the key crew compartments. Um, an LCTA or an LCT-5 could land as many as six tanks, but um, for D-Day, what they decided to do uh, there was a requirement for the deep wading tanks to tow ammo trailers behind them. The reason being that they felt that they would run out of the complement that's on board the tank, so they wanted more ammo. And the second feature is, is that um, they decided to put at least two of the tanks on ramps up at the front of the LCT so that they could fire on the way in. From a, about 500 yards out, the, the tanks were supposed to actually fire at targets, you know, bunkers and things or German defenses on the way in. So in any event, the, um, the, the deep wading ones only had three tanks per um, LCT, one of those being a dozer and two being uh, regular just gun tanks plus uh, ammo trailers. Now, the, um, the DD tanks, in the case the U.S. landings, were landed in, on LCT-6s, and uh, each LTC, LT, LCT-6 had uh, four DD tanks. Um, next slide. Um, just uh, some pictures here. Uh, the picture on the left shows the 70th Tank Battalion, which is the battalion that landed at Utah. Um, this is in uh, pre-landing training. They're on an LCT-5. You can see that you could get six or seven tanks on one of those. Um, the picture on the right is a fairly well-known shot. It shows an LCTA 5 uh, from 741st that lands at Omaha Beach. Um, it shows, you can see the dozer tank towards the back, and you can see a deep wading tr uh, tank sort of towards the front up on the ramp and immediately behind it, um, sort of where that little yellow circle is, that bridging circle is, that's the ammo trailer that it's towing. And I think just worth um, reminding ourselves again that it's the, the the plan was never to just put all their eggs into the bar, in one basket with the DDs. It was always a, a combination of DDs, waders, dozers, and conventional armor coming aside. I guess somehow, again, over the years, we've ended up with this idea that it's all about DDs and if they've gone, there's nothing else. And I don't quite, right. when you see these photos, I don't quite know where that, that idea has come from, but clearly right. it was always part of a, of a, of a larger scheme. Yes. Yeah. 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 There was redundancy to it. You know, there, there was knowledge that the DD tanks had issues and you know, there was, there were backup solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on. Um, Here's a picture of one that actually took, took part in Omaha. This is a, uh, 
an LCTA that landed um, uh, three tanks from the 743rd in front of the Vereville draw on Omaha Beach. Um, this particular LCT was damaged on the way in. Um, and so this picture was taken in the later morning before it landed. Uh, but this shows you the configuration of the LCTAs. They're bringing in the deep waiting tanks. You can see how high the um, two front tanks are riding because they're on those ramps. And then you can see a dozer tank um, um, in the back. Um, so this gives you a sense of what these things look like. Brilliant stuff. Um, here's a little bit more on tactics rather than on the, um, the, the landing process. Um, each of the regimental combat teams um, was allotted a, a, a tank battalion. Now, each of these tank battalions had 32 DD tanks, namely two companies. They had 16 deep waiting tanks, so one company, and they had eight dozer tanks. Four of those dozer tanks were subordinate to the tank battalion. Four of them were to the, uh, the gap reaching teams. In fact, all eight were supposed to assist the, uh, the gap reaching teams, but they uh, at least four from each were, were um, uh, supposed to ultimately go under uh, tank battalion command. The uh, units involved were the um, 741st with the uh, 16th Regimental Combat Team near the Colville Draw, 743rd with the 116th Regimental Combat Team near the Vereville Draw, and the 70th Tank Battalion with the 8th Regimental Combat Team at Utah. Um, I already mentioned the business about the ramps. Um, the DD tanks were supposed to be the first units ashore um, roughly at H hour minus 10. Um, they were supposed to actually precede the infantry. Um, one factor that uh, people are not that well aware of is the tank. When I say land on the shore, I, I don't literally mean that. What the what the DD tanks were actually supposed to do is they were supposed to land so that their tracks were touching the ground, but they were supposed to sit in the water offshore with the back part of the screen erect, like this photo and drawing shows, the erected screen uh, protecting the tank from being overwhelmed by waves that might flood out the engine. The idea being that the that the DD tanks would sit in the water with their hull protected by the water and sit there sort of like remote pillboxes and fire at targets on shore. Um, that actually doesn't happen for a variety of reasons, but that was the tactic that had been planned uh, for use. Now, the use of the DD tanks, um, depending on who they talk to, they're supposed to launch at 4,000 to 6,000 uh, yards from the shoreline, depending on the weather. And this issue is very controversial. Various people gave various figures, you know, depending on, you know, the Navy personnel and the Army personnel involved. The one agreement that was reached is that um, they felt that DD tanks were only suitable in water up to sea conditions of Force 3. Now, of course, the problem on Omaha Beach on D-Day is that um, the weather conditions are Force 4, meaning that the winds were over 18 knots and the waves were over 4 to 6 feet. So the weather conditions were not suitable for launching DDs. And I'll mention what the results of that were in a moment. Um, and as I mentioned, they were supposed to provide their support. They were supposed to come in roughly 400 yards offshore, stay there with the hull submerged and fire from those positions. Okay. Uh, next slide. Just going to go back to a question from Stephen Fisher. And he's asking, does Stephen know where the DDs for Omaha embarked? Navy sources say Slapton. Some army sources say Portland. What's it's Portland. Portland? It's Portland. Um, I have the the war diaries of, I think, I don't have every single LCT, but I have the war diaries for most of the LCTs. And I don't remember any of them being from anywhere other than Portland. I'd have to go back and look, but I'm pretty sure they were all Portland. Okay, um, but I'd, I'd have to look. I I haven't worked on the L, on the LCT side of the story in quite a few years. I did a, an article some years ago when I pulled all of the LCT war diaries and um, I seem to remember from that that they were all coming out of Portland. But I don't I don't want to stand by that. Abs absolutely, I'd have to go back and look at it. No problem. Thank you. Um, uh, here's a map of uh, Omaha Beach, the way they actually landed. There, if you look at some of the accounts, there's a few books out that. Um, show uh, the landing pattern as they intended to land. That is to say the order that the LCTs were supposed to be in. Um, this map, um, which I did oh, at least 10 years ago, um, this shows how they actually landed. I used the war diaries to try to determine where um, the various LCTs were relative to one another. Um, the point being that um, Assault Group 01, um, you'll see in the upper right, they actually launched from sea um, and I'm going to describe what happens in more detail in a moment. Um, so you see the symbols up there on the upper right, and then a portion 
the deep wading tanks and a few of the LCTAs landed on the shore. And a cell group O2 with 743rd all landed on shore. And I'll explain the reasons for that um, in a moment. The important point to make is the um, you can see O1 supporting the uh, uh, the the 16th Regimental Combat Team is mostly over towards Colville Draw and the Saint Laurent Draw, and O2 with 743rd is mostly over towards the Vierville Draw. Um, mm -hmm. Slide. Okay, the big debacle. Um, this is where the myth of all of them sinking comes from, and that's the fate of the 741st uh, Tank Battalion the one that's landing um, in support of the 16th Regimental Combat Team near Colville Draw. Uh, the naval side of it, the uh, the LCT uh, group, the Assault Group 01, is led by Lieutenant J.G. J.E. Barry. Um, now, Barry was appointed by the, the U.S. head of the DD force, uh, Rockwell, who I'll mention in a little bit more detail later on. Um, Barry and Rockwell had discussions before um, D-Day as to who makes the decision about launching the DD tanks. And Rockwell thought that he had made clear to Barry that he wanted the naval officer to make the decision because he felt that the Army officers didn't have enough understanding of sea conditions to make a proper decision. But there were some people who were arguing that it had to be a joint decision between the senior naval commander, in the case of 01, Barry, in the case of the Army side, uh, Captain James Thornton, who was the C Company commander from 741st. Um, so in any event, um, it's uh, on D-Day morning, H-60, uh, Captain James Thornton, in conjunction with the other um, DD Captain uh, 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 Company commander, James Young, decides to launch the DD tanks. The after-action report says Barry tacitly acquiesced in the decision by his failure to take action to change the order directing the launching. Um, this was this is a Navy finding. The Navy was unhappy with Barry's lack of, uh, of, a, uh, of a positive role in the decision whether or not to launch the tanks. So in any event, it was the two Army commanders, and in particular James Thornton, who basically made the decision. Uh, later, Rockwell, who led the U.S. Navy effort uh, for D-Day training of the DD crews, he later remarked about appointing Barry, I chose the wrong man. He thought he made a seriously uh, wrong decision in choosing him. But in any event, um, the after action report of the 743rd Tank Battalion says both commanders agreed that the advantage to be gained by launching the tanks justified the risk of launching the tanks in the heavy seas. They understood that the seas were heavier than what was thought to be prudent to use DD tanks. So in any event, Assault Group 01 begins launching DD tanks at H-50, 0535, uh, from roughly 6,000 yards. In fact, it's mostly C Company, uh, Thornton's company, that goes in the water around 6,000, 5,000 yards offshore. The other company goes a little bit later. The DD tanks begin sinking all, almost immediately. Uh, the main problems are broken metal struts, torn canvases, and flooded engines. Some of the tanks sink immediately. Some of them actually struggle for a few minutes in the in the water conditions. Now, of the two tank companies launched at sea, five DD tanks uh, do make it ashore, the ones from Company B. They didn't launch as far off. Um, they launched from about 2,500 yards off. Now, of these, two of them actually managed to swim all the way to shore. They're the only two on Omaha that swim to shore. Three were landed directly on shore from LCT 600. The young commander of LCT 600 saw what was happening and said to hell with this and just landed LCT 600 on the beach. Um, all the DD tanks of Company C um, sink before reaching shore. Now, as this is happening, Company A on the LCT A5s um, is also approaching the beach. They land in Omaha Beach with uh, 11 deep wading tanks. Uh, they had lost one LCT the night before, which sank during the channel crossing. So of the 56 tanks um, that uh, were part of Assault Group 01, 16 landed successfully, those mainly being deep wading tanks and dozer tanks. Plus, um, there were, of course, the uh, the five DD tanks that managed to mm -hmm. get ashore. So it wasn't 90%, but yes, there were a, a very large portion of the original 56 tanks from Assault Group uh, uh, 01 did sink. Uh, next slide. 
And just what about personnel? Because I, get, I think people are a bit misunderstood sometimes about where the crews are, the tanks, because the, there's a driver, then there's the rest of the crew. So when these tanks that sunk uh, on the way in, how many crewmen went down with them? Because I think I, people I, I, add I, up all the, the, uh, the possibilities. Hmm. But actually, if you look at the ABMC and the records, not that many members of the tank battalion seem to have lost their lives on June the 6th. No, I, I have the figure somewhere, and I don't remember what it was. It was I think it was over a dozen drowned. And it wasn't even drowning; it was um, hypothermia because of the, you know, the weather conditions, the water conditions that day. The um, there's a crew of five on the Shermans. There's a you know three in the turret and a driver and co-driver. Um, the crew was actually given a, a deep breathing device so that they could actually get out of the tank after the tank sank. Um, it would be a pretty frightening prospect to do that. The commander was likely to survive because he was standing on that pedestal up on top of the turret steering the tank. Um, and, you know, but the driver was, you know, deep down on the hull, co-driver was too. And the, especially the, the loader who doesn't have his own hatch in most cases, he would have been vulnerable. But a large number of the crews got out. As I say, some of the tanks were swimming for a little while before they sank. And it became evident, you know, as they got, were being flooded, that they were flooding. And so the commanders mm -hmm. in many cases said, you know, get the hell out of the tank. And a lot of the crews were picked up by neighboring landing craft. You know, whether it was, um, you know, infantry going in or LCMs from the engineer units or that sort of thing. So, yeah, the, the final toll was not as bad as you might think, um, but they still lost a, a, a good number of crews. I'll try to look up the number. I'll send it over to you by an email after. OK, thanks. And I'll, I'll add that to the information later on. But, yeah, when, yeah. I, when I looked into this, I think the last time we chatted about DDs, I, I, know, I know the ABMC only records the overseas casualties. But I was surprised how relatively few there were buried in Normandy. I think it was something like twelve members of the of the seven forty. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not it's not, it's not as large it's not as large as you might expect. Yeah, and again, you get these things where all the tanks sunk and all the crews lost, and it's, it's right. Really no, that that certainly didn't happen. That certainly yeah. didn't happen. No, sorry to um, interrupt your flow, but back. back yeah, to no, no, not a problem. This, these are just pictures of uh, of tanks of the seven forty first on Omaha. The two top pictures of the same DD tank. Um, you can see the chimney, um, and you can see another DD tank down in the um, the the, uh, the lower left. Um, on the lower right is one of those tanks that for many years was over at that sunken tank museum near Omaha Beach, over between Omaha and, and Port en Bassin. And um, that was one that the French had recovered out of the water um, back in... I forget if it was the 1950s or 1960s. Yeah, it's, it's still there. I, I did some film work there back last year, and there's some other bits and pieces inside the museum. They've got um, a periscope or something from one and various other bits and pieces, and that's worth going to, folks. It's, everyone forgets that one. Uh, the Rex Museum on the road from Port and Bessin to Bay, uh, nearer to Port and Bessin, is definitely worth, worth going to. There's some really good stuff there. And next slide. And these are pictures of the deep wading tanks at, uh, at Omaha Beach from... Uh, 741st. Um, you can see they were the top left picture gives a good view of the ammo trailer behind them. Um, you can see uh, another few pictures. The one down in the lower um, left is probably one of the most famous. Yeah. Uh, you can see the the big deep wading trunk with the vehicle number ten on it. The um, the one in the lower right is uh, one of the deep wading tanks that came ashore um, that took part in the day's fighting and. Um, it got hit by one of the uh, anti-craft guns, the 50 millimeter anti-craft guns on one of its bogeys. And you can see it being towed up through Colville um, the day after by uh, uh, an M31 tank recovery vehicle. Uh, next slide. Um, this is the part of Omaha Beach that's forgotten, and that's the, the success of Assault Group 02. Yep. Um, the gentleman over on the, the far right is Lieutenant Dean Rockwell. Um, Rockville, Rockwell was the naval officer assigned to train all the LCT crews and the Army DD um, crews in the methods for launching DDs at sea. So he was the primary guy behind all of the um, the pre-landing operations off of slapped in sand and all that sort of thing. And he was the one who was setting up the various procedures and that sort of thing. And on D-Day, he commanded Assault Group 02, which was the uh, group assigned to land the 743rd in support of the 116th Regimental Combat Team. Um, so during the approach to Omaha Beach, Rockwell quickly realized the sea was too rough to launch the DD tanks. They, you know, he had already established, um, you know, nothing over Force 3. So he consulted with the uh, battalion commander from 743rd, and they all agreed they're going to take the LCTs right to shore. Um, they're not going to launch anything at sea. During the approach, two LCTs were hit by fire. 
another one was damage in transit. That, in fact, was the one that I showed in the picture earlier and arrived late in the day. So in any event, on D-Day morning, aside from uh, uh, LCTs that arrived late for a variety of reasons, um, the DD tanks were successfully landed along with seven D, uh, deep wading tanks and four dozer tanks. Um, so of the 56 tanks that were part of Assault Group 02, 42 landed successfully and three landed later in the day. So 45 of the 56 got ashore. And that's what's oftentimes forgotten about Omaha Beach. Yes, it is true that 741st uh, did suffer very heavy losses during the landing, but 743rd got, ash uh, got ashore, uh, not intact, but certainly with the bulk of its forces. And, and if you were a 743rd veteran and you were watching one of these documentaries 40 years later and you hear that all the tanks, not only did they sink and everybody died, that they accomplished nothing, and there you are. You've been part of a tank crew that not only got onto the beach, but as you will explain later, was, were part of significant actions taking out some of the strong points. You'd be a little bit um, pissed off, we'd say. In well, and they were also the first ones on shore. Um, both yeah. 741st and 743rd were both the first U.S. troops ashore. They landed in front of the infantry. So when Savit Pride Riot comes out and, uh, you know, the character that's played by Tom Hanks says, oh, none of the tanks got ashore, the 743rd people weren't very happy. They were the first people on shore. Um, so in any event, um, these photos uh, um, actually show, the ones on the left show um, 743rd, the ones on the right actually so, show 70th Tank Battalion on, on Utah. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on Utah. Utah is basically... Um, kind of a mix between uh, the two battalions on Omaha. They land largely successfully. There, there's a combination of tanks swimming ashore, DD tanks swimming ashore, and vehicles landing ashore um, directly off the LCTs. But 70th gets ashore at, Om at Utah with very, very few losses. Um, pictures on the left show some deep wading tanks from 743rd. At, uh, at Omaha uh, near Viraville Draw. And as I say, the, the two shots on the right are from uh, 70th Tank Battalion. In fact, one is a dozer tank from Demolition Team 7. You can see the DT-7 marking on the side of it. Um, the one up on the top is interesting. That's Cannonball. That was one of the um, DD or deep wading tanks that was tested with the T-40 um, rocket launchers. Um, there was a U.S. attempt to uh, uh, use 4.5-inch uh, rocket launchers to attack uh, various beach obstructions and things. But the uh, testing office lapped and Sands was so unsuccessful that they decided against using them. But that, that tank has the fittings for the T-40 rockets. All right. Uh, next slide. So what happens on D-Day? Uh, the D-Day tanks um, from 741st, even though there weren't very many of them, there were only five, they were very, very successful in the opening moments of the fighting. Um, there's the big 88 millimeter bunker in, uh, uh, in Resistance Nest 61, on the eastern side of the Colville draw, they knock that out almost immediately. Um, that's a very significant fact in the way that that fight develops, because in contrast, it takes 743rd quite a while to knock out the corresponding bunker over near Vareville draw. So one of the big successes, they take out that 88 millimeter uh, bunker almost immediately. Then after that, the tanks, the 741st, both the deep wading tanks and the DD tanks, gradually reduce uh, WN62 that's up on the hill on the west side of the Colville draw. So yes, they do, even though they're at a depleted strength, they actually do pretty well in suppressing some of the main German strong points. They can't get out, they can't get beyond the hills, and I'll describe that in a moment, but um, from where they are on the beach, they do do a pretty good job. And then later in the day, 741st helps in the penetration of the Saint Laurent draw. Um, 743rd has more um, geographic problems, and I'll describe that in a moment. But in any event, they um, they reduce uh, WN-72 and WN-71 in the Vareville draw. Their biggest problem is that 88 millimeter bunker um, that's sitting right in the mouth of the Vareville draw. Um, that takes until about 8.30 in the morning to uh, knock out. So there's fighting for the better part of an hour to deal with that. We don't know the real details of that. Sad to say, um, there's no record of when that bunker was actually knocked out, neither from the 743rd side nor from the German side. There's probably there were probably no German survivors of that bunker. Um, I've been inside that bunker, Paul. I'm sure you have at some. I think point. we were there together once, weren't we? For that, oh, that's that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you went yeah, up yeah. in the uh, the cherry yep, pit, and true. I didn't. But yeah, I mean, we, yep. we we looked at the tra trajectory of that. Whatever the shot was that went inside that bunker, right. if you work your way back down the eye line, it's somewhere kind of up on the promenade road bit, right? 
few hundred yards down the beach, isn't it? It can't be a yeah. naval shot, but, but right. it, it has to be from something the, on the beach. Yeah, and we know we know from from what surviving records there are of 743rd that 743rd did stage a little tank attack. You know, they they actually charged towards the bunker and fired on it. Um, strangely enough, the best account of 743rd is not the after action reports. There's a there's a novel that came out after the war with the strange title Barbara, uh, written by a, a member of the um, the battalion who later became a, a press journalist up in Philadelphia. And that actually has a very, very good account of 743rd. It's, it's semi-fictionalized, but it's actually pretty pretty close to the real thing. You can pretty much guess from the fictionalized characters who he's talking about. Um, okay. 743rd had real problems with the geography, and I'm going to show some pictures in a minute to explain why. Um, but in any event, an, an officer from the 116th Regimental Combat Team, they were sporting, stated, tanks the 43rd tank battalion, saved the day. They shot the hell out of the Germans, and they got the hell shot out of them. Um, Just a quick question from from another Steve. There's so many Stevens. As you on, there's Stevens watching. Is about the ammunition, whether it was AP or HE or mix, and what was in what was the the, the uh, ammunition schedule that day for DDs. Um, I don't I don't really know. I have the after action report. They don't mention details like that. My suspicion is they were he normally the normal loadout on a Sherman during World War II would have been heavily favoring HE. Um, and certainly for a mission like this, they would have been favoring HE. However, they would have carried a certain amount of AP. The reason that they would have been carrying AP was to deal with um, anti-tank walls and concrete. And the reason is, is that they had done some testing over at Slapton Sands, as I mentioned before, using 4.5-inch rockets. And they found that the rockets didn't penetrate very well. But they did use AP rounds, 75-millimeter AP rounds. And they found that it required quite a few rounds, but that the 75 AP would eventually break through the concrete. So there would have been a mix, the specific mix, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, tactical problems in Omaha Beach. This is down on the Vereville side where 743rd landed. 743rd basically landed in this stretch that we're seeing in this contemporary picture. And you can see immediately what the problem is. The bluffs up behind the beach are much too steep for the tanks to advance off. The only way that they're going to get out is through the draws. And as the next picture uh, shows, the, there's a problem with getting off the draws. This is Vereville Draw. The draw itself on the big picture is in the far right. You can see the road heading up um, away from the beach. And I put a little inset in there. And what that inset shows is it shows um, the 88 millimeter bunker smack dab in the middle of that um, earthwork type uh, stuff. And you can see that they had a, a big tank wall stretching from the, um, from the bunker all the way to the hill to prevent any tanks or vehicles uh, getting up onto the road. And then there was a second 50 millimeter bunker um, you can see further down on the lower right. And I'll show a contemporary picture of that in a moment, if we can see the next one. Yep. And here's Vereville Draw today. Um, the 88 millimeter bunker is almost right in the center, um, right next to the road. Um, that's currently the Na U.S. Army National Guard Memorial. So anybody who's been to Omaha Beach will recognize that right away. Um, on D-Day, there was a road extending um, over towards the left of the bunker that closed off the road and prevented any access. The second bunker, you can see up a little bit further, that held a uh, 50 millimeter uh, dual purpose gun. And so you had those those two uh, very potent bunkers um, uh, defending Vereville Draw, plus all of the other sort of Tobrooks and other bunkers all over the place. There was also a 75 millimeter gun position up on the hill. Um, uh, up sort of in the center, upper center there. Um, so there, were, there was quite a bit of firepower in the sector, but that's a that's a story for another day. Yeah. Um, the other problem they had because of these bluffs is that once um, it became high tide and the ocean came in, there was very little area for the tanks to maneuver. And so you can see this is a shot um, immediately to the east of um, Vereville Draw. You can see the kind of congestion that started to build up. So 743rd had a real problem. When you read the after action report, they're constantly talking about problems about moving around on the beach during the day. Part of it's the amount of equipment there, the infantry troops, and there's simply a lot of casualties on the beach. They simply had a, they would usually, each tank would usually have to send out a runner to, um, you know, to, to steer the driver so that they don't run people over. So it, um, congestion was a major tactical problem on D-Day. Uh, next slide. Uh, basically, what it comes down to is that Omaha was an infantry fight. Um, the tanks could contribute. They certainly contributed to fighting the German strong points.
But because of the terrain restrictions and other things, it came down to an infantry fight. So here's a quote from one of the uh, members of the general board, one of the observers. Those bluffs and those exits were opened solely through the plain undaunted heroism of those infantry teams of the 1st and 29th Division and their attached engineer units. Those were gallant officers who led those troops. And they, they were fine soldiers who followed these officers. That's the basic bottom line point about Omaha Beach. It was not a tank fight. It was an infantry fight. The tanks played a largely secondary role, and it's hard to see how they could have played much more of a role, largely because of the terrain. It ha had less to do with the number of tanks that sank and had a lot more to do with the terrain. Um, next slide. Okay, getting back to the original, um, where this myth started off. Did 90% of the USDD tanks sink? Well, obviously the answer is no. Um, 741st tank 10 launched 29 at sea, 21 sank, five reached shore. Others were lost or failed to launch for various reasons. 743rd tank 10 landed 28 DD tanks on the shore. Four had been lost at sea when an LCT sank. 70th tank battalion on Utah launched 28 DD tanks at sea. 27 of the 28 swam to shore. Five were lost at sea. One was sunk and four lost an LCT that sank. So in total of the 96 USDD tanks, 60 landed, so 62%. 22 sank while swimming, practically all from uh, C&B Company of 741st, and 14 were lost when LCTs sank. Um, of the 144 U.S. Sherman tanks aimed at Omaha, Utah for Neptune, 107 reached shore, so roughly 74% of the tanks. And that figure is forgotten. By concentrating yeah. on DD tanks and forgetting the deep wading tanks, it's forgotten that there were three companies of deep wading tanks that landed mostly successfully. And to give a point of comparison, on the British and Canadian beaches, 194 DD tanks were deployed in four regiments, roughly 40 DD tanks each. Uh, 162, about 83%, reached the beaches. So yes, on the British Canadian beaches, they, they did uh, more landed on shore. It should also be added, and I'm not going to go into any detail here because it's outside the scope. A lot of the British and Canadian DD uh, tanks uh, did what was sometimes called um, deep wading or, or wet wading in the sense they didn't actually swim in. The uh, LCTs dropped on in relatively shallow water, and they were actually able to, to drive in rather than having to swim in. Um, but I'm not going to get into that today. Um, and next slide. Um, this is the U.S. postmortem after D-Day. These are various reports that came out, mostly um, Army and Navy ones. Okay, starting off, um, this is a general board report. The general board reported to the U.S. Army um, after the war. The DD device, uh, DD device was not satisfactory for the purpose intended, and medium tanks can be landed more effectively from LCTs directly onto the beach than swimming in. Losses, in fact, were lower amongst the units landing directly on the beach, parenthetically the deep wading tanks. Um, the assault group 02, this report was from Rockwell. The DD tank is not an effective weapon in amphibious warfare unless ideal sea conditions exist. Um, this is the Navy report, action report at Colville Verville. Um, because of the vulnerability of its flotation equipment and the general unseaworthiness of the entire vehicle, the DD tank is not a pr practicable, practicable weapon for use in assault landings on open beaches. And then uh, finally, the first U.S. Army report, the use of DD tanks, their present state of development is restricted to quiet water. So not a lot of happiness about DD tanks, and they're not going to be extensively used. Um, next slide. And I think just also, but I'll, I'll let you carry on in a minute, is that is that you made the point about the tanks ultimately not being very suitable for what the terrain was on Omaha. Whereas, again, if we're going to make that comparison to S.W.O.R.D., and I'm thinking of all those great photos of the Sherman tanks supporting the commandos going into Wiesra, I mean, they suddenly found themselves in an environment where they had a lot to do, were, were, were in, a, in a suitable situation. It worked really well. So at the end of the day, the post-mortems there are, again, although they had some problems getting some of them ashore, they didn't all make it, they had this real results based but we did this we did this we did this with them which which you don't well i guess you have explained how they help neutralize the bunkers on the beaches once off the beach there isn't that immediate task for them to do yeah i i, I haven't covered anything post d-day i mean the dd tanks remained in service with the u.s army well after d-day yeah um you can find pictures of dd tanks they, they removed all the gear so you have to know what you're looking at but and I, I didn't put any pictures up here but i have i have plenty of pictures of u.s army dd tanks being used 
you know, fighting in the Bocage in the weeks after the, the actual landing. So it's not as though they're just used on DD, then they disappeared. They continued to be used as ordinary um, Sherman tanks during the later part of the campaign. But um, just talking about their use um, uh, later on, or the use of DD tanks, not specifically the Neptune ones, they were used during Operation Dragoon, and it was a complete contrast. Hmm. Um, the, the weather conditions were entirely different. This is mid-August down in, on the Mediterranean in southern France, and they didn't have any of the landing problems because the water conditions were calm, and so they were very, very well suited to that. And in fact, many of the DD tanks that were used down at Dragoon were ones that had been up in the UK that had been used for training U.S. troops for, for Operation Neptune. Um, DD tanks were subsequently used in 1945 during the Rhine River crossing, both by the U.S. Army and by the British Army. Um, they policed up the surviving vehicles and um, refurbished them, and they were used for the Rhine crossing. Uh, now, curiously enough, in the case of the U.S. Army, um, very few were actually used in the water. Um, the reason is, is that by then a lot of the canvas screens were in bad shape, and so it, as often as not, they were just driven across bridges or whatever. Um, the U.S. Army and U.S. Marine Corps refused to use DD in the Pacific Theater of Operations. There were other alternatives, whether deep waiting. And uh, Trent was asking a little bit before about the Ritchie device. Um, there's yeah, a picture of the Ritchie yeah. device down in the, in the lower right. Um, that was used experimentally um, uh, during the final campaign, especially Okinawa. Um, but it came too late for D-Day. Um, they, they, those weren't ready for uh, for Normandy. Uh, I think it's last slide. Last slide is a bit of bit of self. Yeah, here's, here's, some, here's, some, here's, some, yeah. Self, here's here's some here's some some self promotion. Um, the one in the upper um, left is if anybody's interested in the broader issue of another D-Day myth, the myth that the U.S. Army refused to use armored funnies in D-Day, which is another another load of baloney. Um, I did a recent article on that, a more academic article, a lot of footnotes in Journal of Military History. That appeared um, a bit over a year ago. So if you're interested in that whole myth, um, try to track up a, a, a copy of that. Um, I did a history in the Osprey New Vanguard series on U.S. amphibious tanks. That talks about U.S. amphibious tanks in general, not specifically DD tanks, but the Ritchie device and deep weighting tanks and blue freeze and all that. Um, I did another small Osprey on tanks of D-Day, more broadly, you know, all five beaches, what landed there, what units were involved, um, so more of a big picture thing, not specifically D-D tanks. And then I did an article some years ago for World War II magazine on um, the D-D tanks, or, or tanks in general on Omaha Beach. Um, but that's, a, that's aimed at a more general audience. So if you, if you want to, if you want to see all the footnotes and all of the uh, historical archival uh, resources. I'd recommend the the article from Journal of Military History. Brilliant, and I, I can heartily recommend those books. That tanks on D Day. It's the it's the illustrations I think are so good. The the color the color plates. Um, uh, uh, I'll try and find one there. Are really really exceptional. Uh, you can see there, folks. Um, but we have a few questions. Um, predictably, some of them are from Stephen Fisher. So the first one is. Based on his analysis of the landing tables, there was significantly less armor total landed at H hour on Omaha compared to the ETF beaches. What are your thoughts? And he adds to this, uh, it was five regiments, 10 squadrons landing on the ETF beaches. So, uh, well, I'll ask the question, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, that, that's certainly true. and But it's partly just, number one, uh, it there were very, very strong restrictions on the number of landing Craft, LCTs and other types of landing craft for the beaches. And so that put an immediate limit as to how much could go ashore. That has more to do with naval planning rather than army planning. Um, the other beaches also get a lot more armor because it was done in a different fashion on, on the British beaches. I'm not going to go into detail about this. Yeah, this yeah. deserves a, a, a treatment on its own. Uh, on, the Brit on the British and Canadian beaches, there was a use of DD tanks, but there was also use of deep weighting tanks also. There were units that came ashore later with the with the deep waiting tanks. Then, in addition to that, there was a lot more armor on the British and Canadian beaches because the RE, the the Royal Engineers also landed specialized armor. The U.S. did a little bit with the dozer tanks, but there was substantially more specialized armor uh, landing on the um, the British and Canadian beaches. But once again, that's outside the scope of this yeah, yeah, um, yeah. this talk, and that that's better dealt with with talks about. Uh, what occurred on the British beaches and on the Canadian beaches, or more broadly on uh, naval planning for the landing. 
Yeah, brilliant. And another Stephen is asking, what was that? We're going back to DDs, Nomar. What was their time in the water, their float rating? We also had someone ask about what their draft was in the water when they were fully loaded. So I know that technical data is in the books there, but is there kind of a little summary you can give of how? Yeah, of how I don't. It, that kind of stuff I don't remember off the top of my head. The um, the illustration that I showed earlier shows the depth that a Sherman would float in, not fully loaded. So if you remember that illustration way back when, that shows you that, that shows you the drift. Yeah, there, there we go. That shows you uh, the the level of a Sherman not fully loaded. It would be a little bit uh, deeper in the water once the ammunition is loaded on board. Um, and I'll t I'll tell you another story. I didn't mention this because I've never been able to confirm it. One of the problems with 741st may have been that the crews overloaded the Shermans with the ammunition. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this in a couple of veterans interviews, and there's a hint of it in uh, the book, Barbara. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, the deep waiting tanks were also equipped with an ammunition trailer to bring more ammunition ashore. And the reason for that is that the U.S. Army felt that these tanks were going to be fighting on the beach all day long and that they'd run out of ammunition quite soon. And they'd have no easy way to get ammunition later in the day. So they wanted to have as much ammunition as possible. That's why the, the trailers were involved. There are some hints that the DD tank crews felt that they needed more ammunition. And at least one account claims they loaded an extra 50 rounds of 75 millimeter ammunition in their Shermans beyond the usual load, which is roughly 75, 80 rounds. That's another ton or two of stuff. Yeah. And so it's interesting. I don't think that it can be proved one way or the other. The after action reports don't mention it at all. I've got all the published histories and the unpublished um, after action reports counts for both of those battalions. There's no mention of that issue at all, but um, it's one of those mysteries out there. Um, maybe someday we'll find an answer. Part of the problem is, is that so few of the um, the senior commanders from 741st survived. Both of those DD company commanders, Thornton and Young, both of them were killed um, several weeks after D-Day. 741st saw an awful lot of combat, and very few of the veterans of 741st from Normandy survived the war. Um, as I say, both company commanders were killed within a month or so of, of Normandy. And, you know, there's just not a lot of people uh, that anyone could have talked to to talk about those kind of issues involved in the 741st. And that came up in the sidebar about the vet veterans' response to this. And, and people were saying, what happened to these battalions after DD? And as you made the point there, they carried on. They just were stripped of the, the DD aspect and carried on being tanks on the on Yeah, the, on they the were just, seven, 741st fights were right up to the end of the war, so just 743rd. Uh, yeah. Both of them saw an awful lot of combat action. So, um, yeah, they were in the thick of it. I've got plenty of pictures of tanks from both of the battalions. In fact, there's a, an interesting picture of, uh, I think it was a deep waiting tank in Germany in 1945, and it was the la literally the last Sherman from D-Day. At wow. least one Sherman went all the way from D-Day all the way into Germany in March 1945. Fantastic. And uh, just uh, 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 to, to confirm some, Gary is asking, sorry if you missed this, but were any LCTs from 01 hit by enemy fire or mines on approach to the beach? Or um, From 01, not that I am aware of. Um, 01, as far as I know, the LCT that was lost there, there were at least two LCTs that were lost on the night traveled uh, between the UK and Normandy. And it appears to have been weather-based. You know, there were radio signals from the LCTs, you know, to the um, the command LCT basically saying we're taking on water and then boop, the, the LCT disappeared. Um, and the same thing happened off of Utah. Um, there were problems with the LCT, some of them breaking in half, um, partly because of the weather conditions. So the answer is the LCTs, um, at least for 01 and some of them for Utah were lost at sea because of weather, not by enemy action. I don't know of any instances where it was uh, mine damage. And as you're well aware, there was considerable mine sweeping um, action before mm. the landings. In the case of O2, several of the LCTs were hit by that 88 millimeter bunker, but by then they were ashore. Um, several of the LCTs were hit to the point where they couldn't pull off the beach, or at least one of them pulled off the beach and then sank afterwards. Um, that 88 um, battery hit several landing craft, not only LCTs, but um, other, uh, they, it, they also hit, for example, an LCI. Um, so that 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 particular bunker was extremely deadly in the first hour or so on, on D-Day. Um, another one, uh, it's about the um, the dropping of the screens. There's a conversation on the sidebar about how quick into action they could go. Uh, and people are saying, Brad is saying that they can, you know, the screens are controlled from inside the tank. But of course, yes. 
that's if everything's working perfectly. If, if, if things get hit, if there's, if there's damage to the outside, you can see from some of those photos there that clearly um, it, 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 it can work really well. But in your examination of this, the process of the tanks that made it ashore, be they the swimming ones or the ones that landed directly, did the process of going into action go generally pretty smoothly or were there problems of just the, the, the screens and getting stuck and things like that? I've never read an account of where they had problems with the screen not co going down. There were compressed air bottles on the on the exterior of the tank, uh, on the lower glacy plate. Actually, they were attached right at the top of the transmission cover. And there were lines running inside the tank so that the driver, co-driver, could remove the pressure. And by removing the air pressure, the columns would compress and then the, the screen would collapse. And as I mentioned earlier, the plan was not to collapse the whole screen. The yeah. idea was just to collapse the front of the screen and leave the back of the screen up to uh, to protect against waves. And so you can see in those pictures that the rear screen appears to still be up. That was deliberate. That's not that's not from the screens accidentally staying up in the back. That's a deliberate effort, part of that plan to allow the tanks to sit in the water and fire from the protection of the water. Uh, one last question from the viewers, and that's, uh, you know, you, you continue to talk about the fact that 741st particularly went on to, to fight, but were they, were their tanks swapped out or were they, the, uh, or they just carried on using the DDs minus the screens? Um, they were, they continued to use their uh, DDA tanks until they broke down or were replaced. The plan was um, to cut away the screens. The crews were trained and they had knives or whatever type of device on board the tanks. They were supposed to, at some point during the course of the day, and I forget what the exact instructions were, they were supposed to drive up on the beach, get out of the tank, take knives and cut away the canvas screen and, dis and dispose of the screens on the beach. They weren't supposed to leave the screens on. There was some concern that the canvas screens would be a fire hazard. And so the plan was cut off the screens and, um, you know, continue to use the tank as a, as a conventional tank. You know, remove all of the other... Uh, 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 junk associated with the DD devices, like the compressed air tanks, and you know that that chimney on the back, and there was a a little platform up behind the commander where he would steer the tank, and there was a steering device, and there was a special driver periscope. There was a lot of little parts associated with the DD tank besides the screen. They were supposed to get rid of all that. There are some pretty good pictures of um, 70th Tank Battalion from Utah, a few days into the fighting, where you can see DD tanks with all the stuff removed. Um, unfortunately, I didn't put them in this presentation, but they're out there floating around. Um, and what ended up happening, obviously 741st had to get new tanks because they sank so many. So they would have just gone M4A1s or M4s and they would have continued to fight with other tanks. Um, there were reserve tanks held offshore. Those were brought in. And so some of the crews that survived would have been given new tanks almost immediately. Um, but yes, the, the whatever tanks, the deep weighting tanks and whatever DD tanks uh, survived, did stay in combat in Normandy um, and were just used as ordinary tanks. Am I muted? Yeah, we, this is the final, final question. So we were talking earlier about the, um, the, the training for the, the actual operation of the amphibious tanks. So the, 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 the protective gear, diving gear, getting out, blah, blah, blah. But the actual getting off the beach, because, you know, if we're going back to Dieppe, we're talking about things that happened there. And there's the myth that the Churchill didn't make it off the beach. But in fact, most of them did, then got stuck in the town, then went back to the beach to make their final stand. But in your assessment of the performance of both 741st and 743rd, had enough attention been paid to once you're on the beach, getting over the shingle, getting over the various obstacles? Because, you know, we could go down a whole rabbit hole of talking about the, the draws having their differences, defenses. Some have minefields, some have walls, some have ditches. But had they been thoroughly prepared for what they were going to meet getting off the beach to the ground before? They, they were warned quite a bit about um, shing the problem of shingle. So they were aware of that. They were aware to be very, very careful when approaching areas of shingle. And as you know, Omaha is um, a very mixed, um, yeah, very mixed terrain as far as shingle is concerned. There are sections of the beach that had lots of shingle where it was a big problem, and but and then there were other parts of the beach that were mostly sand. And then there were parts that had mixed. So you can see this DD tank, the the picture here. You can see that that tank is mired, whether it was from the shingle or the sand underneath the shingle. They did have problems with the soft soil. Um, that's very clearly the case. There were a number of both DD tanks and deep wading tanks that basically got stuck in either shingle or sand um, on D-Day. 
Um, you know, and part of this was the problem of maneuvering. You know, sometimes they had no choice. If they tried to get off the beach, in many cases, they had dead bodies all over the place. The drivers were very reluctant to drive over, you know, bodies not knowing whether they were dead or wounded or whatever. And so tanks had maneuvered to places where they probably shouldn't have and gotten into areas of shingle and then got bogged down. So, yes, shingle was a problem. But, yes, also um, the lessons of, of DF were very clearly understood. And there was a lot of training on this whole issue of shingle and uh, the problems presented by shingle. And then just, you know, we referenced that photo in the top right there, you know, that uh, having got, been many, many times to Omaha Beach, given that I live 50 minutes away, you, you know, something sitting on the beach, if two or three tides have then happened after that, they can sink into holes. So the photographic record that we have ta of tanks taken a day, two days, even a week later, aren't necessarily a good indication of what that tank's fate was on D-Day because right. tides have affected its behavior, hatches have been left over, water's come in, sand has moved around it. So I think you know, it's a lesson to us all to not always take some of the photographic evidence as being exactly literal to what happened. It depends on when that photo was taken and what has happened to the beach in the meantime. That, that particular one in the upper right is from 70th Tank Battalion from uh, uh, from uh, 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 the ones on, on Utah Beach. Utah, yeah. that, that particular tank ran into a bomb crater. That's something that we also forget about at Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach was supposed to be bombed by heavy bombers, and that would have led to a lot of bomb craters in Omaha Beach. There were no bomb craters in Omaha Beach. On Utah, however, there were. And in this particular case, Cannonball from C Company of 70th Tank Battalion they ran into one of those bomb craters and got got drowned drowned out. It wasn't because they were drowned out, you know, because of the wading trunk or anything. They simply fell into a shell hole and couldn't get themselves out of the shell hole. Yeah, or bomb. Well, I should say bomb crater, not shell hole. Bomb crater. Yeah. I think we should leave it there because otherwise we'll just go down to a minefield of potential <laughs> questions that that we should better use to another time. So as always, people have absolutely loved it. You've taken us through a subject. Um, from beginning to end and and not gone too bogged down pun intended into the into the rabbit holes that we can go into with this type of discussion so yeah i mean come back in the future and let's 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 do the other aspect let's do the, the americans refusing the british tanks because that's the other myth that just doesn't go away peter caddick adams addressed it a bit in stand and steel and it comes up here and there but that's another one that the americans stubbornly refused british uh, vehicles and we can we can nip that one in the bud at some point but anyway it's been brilliant. I'll remind people again that the links to Stephen's books or some of them in the description below. There are lots more worth getting there. You tackle the air war in Normandy, v Operation Crossbow, all worth getting. Um, um, I can't wait to invite you again, Steve. Um, Look forward brilliant. to talking again. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you all again tomorrow. This is Paul Woodhouse for World War II TV saying thank you very much for your attention and your brilliant questions. Cheers, everybody. Bye.